Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Odd Man Front, a uh, Sumer Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Parker Fleming, and I'm excited today to have a conversation with Seth Walder, a uh, sports analytics writer at ESPN. Seth, thanks for joining me today. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me, Parker. Uh, really, really excited to talk to you, Seth. As listeners of this podcast know, uh, I've been interviewing people in and around the sports analytics uh, space and really just interested, you know, the question I'm sure you get all the time as well is how do I get into this? How do I get into sports analytics? Uh, and, and I think it's a very fun question because no one has the same answer and a bunch of people have very divergent paths. And so I just want to talk to people about kind of being in sports analytics, how they get there, how they think about the game, specifically football now that we're in season and, uh, and, and some current research. So really, really excited to, uh, to dive in and talk about that with you. For people who are listening, if you're not subscribed to the Sumer Sports Podcast, I don't know what you're doing. You get Thomas Dimitrov and Eric Eager, Dr. Eric Eager, twice a week talking about football. Tay Sheth and Sean Syed are doing some of the sharpest film and scheme and data breakdowns on Tuesdays. Great stuff all around over there. So make sure you're subscribed so you can get all of those podcasts. Without further ado, uh, Seth, let's, let's go ahead and get into it. All right. I will tell you my preparation for this podcast involved your LinkedIn page. Um, and so that's that's where I'm basing a lot of this on. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I was not aware that you uh, had some time across the pond growing up. Are you uh, are you originally from uh, London? Did you go to school over there? I, I, I see that in your uh, in your bio here. Uh, I, I half grew up there, I guess I, I, we moved there uh, summer after sixth grade. And um, so I spent the rest of, the rest of my middle and high school uh, growing up in growing up in London. And um, yeah, it was it was great. So I was there for six years. My family was there for nine. Yeah. Were you an American football fan before you moved over there? Uh, did you become yeah. a football fan over there or how did that work? No, I, I was, but I was more of a baseball person. I mean, uh, like my morning ritual was basically like wake up, the first thing I do, wake up, walk over to my computer, open it up, check MLB.com, see if the Red Sox won. And like, then it was going to be a good day or bad day, you know, depending on that. The time difference was, a, you know, just, just awful. And I would, and this was like, at the end of my high school time was like the very beginning of MLB TV. Um, and it was never smooth or, you know, it was always like very glitchy and laggy, but there would be times when I would like, come home from a night out and it'd be like 1230 and I could be like, Ooh, I'll, I can watch like a couple innings of this, of the game sort of, uh, which was really at the time it was like mind blowing for football. Uh, yeah, they actually played, there's a channel sky sports four. And I, I, I don't know if they still, I know they definitely show some games. I don't know if it's the same, but they would show a one, they would show a game at one and, and four, or you know, six and nine there. And, uh, and I was always, it was always like, it was never the best game. I always remember that. It was always like, we always would be like, do, do they have to pay more for the good teams? You know, it was always just like a random, uh, a random assortment, but that was, that was still good when, uh, you know, got to see football. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, you had to be a little bit more hardcore back in the day. It's a little bit easier to, to get access to some of that now. And heck, they're, you know, going over there a couple of times uh, a week. So you, you finish up high school and you go to Bowden in Maine. Correct. Um, yeah, Bowden in Maine. Yep. Yeah. Bowden. Nice. Excuse me. Of course, I was okay. going to mess that up. I was just trying to not say Bowden or something <laughs> weird. So I was close enough. Um, shout out to Maine. I spent uh, two months there in 2021 and, and want to move back, but my wife uh, insists that we have to live in, in a civilized place. We can't live in a cabin on the water in, in Maine and not talk to anyone. But uh, uh, what did you go to college for? Liberal, liberal arts school. So the answer is like, you know, everything. I mean, I started gov government was my major. I ended up spending, I ended up being an art minor uh, and I ended up spending a lot of, a lot of time uh, in doing visual arts, uh, which was a surprise to me, but I think was a, a testament to the like idea of liberal arts. You don't know what you're going to find. Uh, but I was also worked in the newspaper. So that was kind of our, that was, you okay. know, it's like my, all my friends played sports, you know, and I was, you know, I played newspaper and, uh, and, uh, like varsity, you know, of course. Uh, and, uh, uh, no, so that, that was kind of my job training. Um, you know, the newspaper there was a, a, like a really formative experience. I mean, you gotta, you and a bunch of other students are just figuring out how to, how to run this paper. That's awesome. What kind of, uh, what kind of visual art did you do? Photography mostly. Um, oh, cool. yeah. 
I, uh, do you still do you still is photography still a hobby? That's totally off topic, but I'm just fascinated by that. Uh, I wish it were. I, I, I. My intention is to. My intention always is, but I, I do intend to try and try and do more. It would be fun to get like back in the dark room. Uh, I've been thinking about doing that, but no, I haven't been. But it would be great too. It's very like very fun. So yeah, like really enjoyed studying that in college. If there was all the time in the world, we could do everything that we got into in college yeah. and got super obsessed with. Absolutely. Um, okay, so you're working for the newspaper, and I'm assuming at a smaller liberal arts college in Maine, you're not necessarily doing a lot of sports reporting, and uh, and maybe not writing as much about that. Uh, was there a point where you said, hey, I want to be a journalist. Hey, I want to be a sports writer specifically. What was kind of the turn there and how did you get into that? Yeah, so I guess, you know, so I was the sports editor my freshman and sophomore years there. And I, that was sort of a natural fit, but it's not like we were talking about, you know, it was boat in sports, not professional sports, right? Um, and I, I liked that quite a bit, but then I, I wasn't totally focused on sports. I was more focused on the newspaper as a whole. And and once I like moved on, it was like uh, higher at the newspaper after that, you know, sports just becomes just one, one little piece of it. I think uh, I remember actually my sophomore year, we had this great uh, advisor named Sandy Polster who worked, um, who had a long journalism career. He had retired. Uh, he, he lived in Maine, uh, so nearby the college, and he gave us like critiques every week of the issue. And he would break down everyone's articles and say, you know, you could have you could have led with this, you could have whatever, you know. And it was really helpful. I, I just remember he was giving us like a talk and he asked everyone, uh, do you, who wants to pursue a career in journalism? And I remember thinking at the moment, you know, I think I do. Uh, and so I remember raising my hand. I, I decided that first. And then I think later came to the point of feeling like, you know, I think I would really like to do sports journalism. Sports is um, a passion for me. And I, I think it was helpful to like come to that conclusion in that order, not sports. Oh, I want to work in sports and then journalism. Like, I think it's like, I'm not, I'm just, for me, at least, I think it was important to come to say, like, I, I really am passionate about journalism and then be like, well, the best thing would be to do that in sports. And that's so true of people who are, you know, more and more in the um, traditional or technical route into analytics too, is like, hey, go decide that you want to get a technical degree and yeah. you want to use it for sports. Yeah. Because then you get the broader array of tools, you get the disposition and, uh, and are a little bit um, set up kind of, kind of more on a, on a solid foundation in, in my opinion. Um Okay, so totally so that's that. yeah. yeah. Um, that that progression is is uh, interesting and makes it makes a lot of sense. So uh, ending ending college, you're looking for internships. You you go and work for New York Daily News. Is that correct? That's where that's where your internship was as as well. Yeah, so I got an internship after college to work for the New York Daily News is investig sports investigative team. Uh, the internship was supposed to really be about the Roger Clemens perjury trial. Um, and uh, so I like followed this, I went with our, you know, we had a really good investigative team. And uh, yeah, I went with them to DC and the day I went down there, the second day of the trial, there was a mistrial. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and it was like, oh, wow, okay. That's, that was kind of supposed to be my, uh, my, my, my couple months here. So I ended up just having like a normal, kind of normal sports internship um, help, helped out. And um, that went well and they hired me to, to cover high school sports then in the city uh, after that. And so that's what I did the, the next year. That was a like a wild job completely. You know, I wasn't uh, from New York and there's so many high schools here. And I mean, like, you know, obviously. And uh, and it was, it, was a bit, it was just so many people to know, like learn and meet and know. And, and there's no tools, you know what I mean? Like, like the only way is like go and, uh, you know, stand in the rain and like mark down each play. Okay, from four yard run, thirty one to the thirty five, and like it's just like a, so it's raining. The, the notebook is my box score. Uh, you know, like there would be times I'd be like, uh, I have vivid memories of being like on the looking there, and they're like the refs like fourth down, and the coach is screaming, "It's not fourth down! What are you talking about?" And I, I would I would look at my notebook. I'm like you know, it really isn't fourth down actually, you know, but like, it's like, it's just the wild west. So, uh, 
<laughs> That's sure. really fun. Um, and, and so it sounds like you had a numbers bent kind of from the start there of saying, I, I you know, I want to keep track of these things and I want to incorporate them in, in my writing. Uh, when when you started doing the high school stuff kind of before you graduated, and moved on, you were you were on the beat for both NFL teams there. Um, were you kind of more numbers inclined or did that come later? I think it was always numbers inclined. I should say that my big break came when the Jets traded for Tim Tebow. And uh, I was covering high schools. My boss brought me in and was like, hey, we want to send you to the Jets training camp. We just want you to write about just Tim Tebow. And I was like, okay. So uh, <laughs> I was like, okay. So they did that and that went well. And that's how I ended up starting to cover the Jets. Um, I can't believe Tim Tebow beat is not in your LinkedIn or in your phone. <laughs> it really should be. It really should be. <laughs> There's a... So yes, I was always, I always had a quantitative bent. I mean, you know, I think it's like for people roughly my age, I think it's like very cliche. It's like, you know, when I was in high school, I read Moneyball and I was like, whoa. And uh, that really spoke to me. And then I was in college reading fan graphs. And uh, yeah, so I always came at it from a quantitative bent, I guess. Uh, and uh Yes, I was the reporter in the – if you ask my colleagues who are on the Jets beat, like I was the one always saying like they got to go for this on fourth down. Like, you know, they're down 14, they score a touchdown, and I was saying like you got to go for two, right? And at, at that time, nobody was doing that. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I was sort of the uh, – oh, you know, there goes Seth again, always saying you got to go for it. And uh, so – but but not – so yes, I had a quantitative, I came at things sometimes from a quantitative angle, but I didn't, I didn't have the technical analytical skills at that point. Okay. Hi, I want to ask about that. It's a beautiful segue to what I want to get to is when did you first start R? When is the first time you opened up like an R console or, or coding or any kind of technical, uh, technical uh, the, software? The first time I opened up R was probably like, it was probably like 2015, but I didn't really do anything. I was, I was sort of like, that was, you know, this is, I'm, this is like, we're, I'm still on the, on the jet speed or giant speed at that point. Um, I didn't really, I was like, this seems useful, but I didn't really do much. Um, like looking back, yeah, I guess it, I did. I did figure out, I guess, some things, but not really. I mean, I, that's what I'm, so I'm saying. I first opened it up. It wasn't until I actually uh, got to ESPN that I would say that I started coding. Okay, cool. And so, so that's interesting as well as they're talking about like kind of your path and how you got into it. You got hired as an analytics writer, and then said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn the technical skills along the way to kind of help me in that in that endeavor." Um, do you think that writing on the beat and kind of being in the day in day out pulse of a team gives you a unique perspective on how to use numbers and how to incorporate analytics into, uh, into your writing and into thinking about football. I don't know. Um, if you hear that they're doing construction, my building, if you, if you hear the rumbling, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, it, the, do it, does it help in the beat? I guess it helps in the sense of just that, like I'm, you really had to look for stories on the beat. I think one of the things that I honestly found stressful about the job was like every day you got to come up with a story. And that meant, you know, many days I would walk, you know, I'm walking into that building and I don't know what that story is going to be yet. And you have a limited, you know, and you have a press conference and you have 45 minutes in the locker room and you got to figure something out in that time. Uh, so, and so I guess it helped from just thinking about you know, potential stories and, and, and what they could be and where they could be. The investigative mindset and the analytical mindset are, are probably pretty similar, uh, pretty big overlaps there in terms of, I want to find out, I've got to look under the surface and kind of uh, find, find those trends. Um, so that, that, that does make a lot of sense. You took the ESPN job um, after being on that beat for a little bit and, and started writing for them. Um, what was that like to get? I mean, I, I, I think all of us can say like, oh, the, getting a job at ESPN is a, is a pretty big uh, pretty big milestone and pretty cool and, and maybe even a little surreal not to put words in your mouth. What was it like to uh, to get to work for, for the flagship and, and kind of come aboard uh, with, with ESPN? It was, yeah, it was sort of surreal. It was, it, was, it was perfect for me. I was, you know, so happy to be able to come to ESPN. It's obviously a great... Uh, you know, a great place to work and a great outlet, but also I was really excited about being part of the analytics team 
at ESPN. And then like, like I talked about, I really didn't have a lot of those technical skills, right? Which was fine. That was not my job was we have all these people who are creating metrics. It's your job to turn those metrics into stories. You need to understand how they get there, but you don't need to be doing any modeling yourself. Um, but it was awesome because I got to work with all these super smart people and soak it up from them and learn from all of them. And like, yeah, that's, you know, that I wouldn't have been. And so that's what helped me sort of build some of those technical skills that I didn't have. Not like, not like my coworkers who are amazing. I'm saying, you know, for, for me, but, and I think, uh, so anyway, I think that was all, that was all great. And I was, I was really happy about that. What is kind of your day to day, uh, and if it's changed since the beginning, you could give us a little bit of both. What's kind of your day to day as a as an analytics writer? What does that look like for you? Oh, uh, it definitely it's definitely changed. It's also definitely like very different inside or outside of season. In season, I mean, like today, uh, what I do is on Thursdays is like my most chaotic day. So I have to I do like a, like, like a, an X factor blurb for every every game. Uh, then I do, I do this six, so I'm writing a whole bunch of things. I do this six or uh, five statistical nuggets that are sort of informing this week's matchups or just something, uh, for our Saturday file. I really like that because I, I often find that there's, I have many notes. They're not like a full article, but just like notes, things that I've come across when I'm looking at other things that are, Oh, wow, this is interesting. Or this applies to this game. And so this is, that's a really good place to put some of that stuff. I also have a bunch of our a bunch of our betting stuff is due on Thursday. And so I have a bunch of my betting models I have to get run by, by, by Thursday. And so I spent a lot of time, it's not, it's like, there's just a manual element to that, just getting the data updated from last week's games. And, you know, you, we try and automate as much as we can, but there's, there's just some things that have to be have to be done, and then some of it actually just takes time to run. So I have to, I have to, you know, it's like I'm oh writing this. So this is going to take like 30 minutes over here to run. Let's make sure I get that going while in the background. Um, and so I get all of those betting models run, and then I put out. I get a couple of a couple of uh, a couple of those bets. I'll put into our like weekend betting file. And then I also sort of am sort of compiling a list of bets that are or compiling a list of topics for Daily Wager, which is our betting show that I go on a Friday. And I said to them, hey, here's a whole bunch of things like bets or other topics I could talk about. And then they'll they'll decide what they what they want. I've forgotten some some other things, I'm sure, that I'm gonna remember in like 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> What is um, one way that you think about football differently now, kind of being in the analytics as deep as you are, uh, that, that maybe you've changed your mind on in the last you know couple of years or since you started out or since you're on the beat? Wow. Well, firstly, can I ask you, can you hear this construction or no? Is it... I can, but it's a small minor noise. I don't think it's going to be an issue on the recording or anything. So right. I, I, don't, I don't think it's a problem. Yeah. What are some ways, I mean, I think about the game, like since before I got to ESPN, I mean, so differently. I'll give you a few. Um, certainly a big one, we're probably going to talk about something related to this would be like, I just, when we, the first major player track metric that we created that Brian Burke, my coworker created was our, our win rate metrics. And it just made me pay so much attention to what's going on in the trenches. Uh, I think that, and, and not and not just sacks, right? And so like and just and just the effect that we see on offensive linemen getting beat and what that means for the passing game uh, or the running game, but what that means and how that might not show up necessarily in in a sack, but like how it just can depress an entire the offense's overall efficiency. And and so like that's one. I think another one would be like the 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 one where I'm almost throwing my hands up, but like I think we have so far to go when it comes to quantifying scheme, and I think we know this, right? Like we can see, we can see that the you know McVay Shanahan offense and their offshoots are clearly outperforming what we would otherwise think of as like being the sum of their parts, and I, I like to me I I think about it because it's like it's the thing that you have to keep in mind and understand that at least for what I do, I don't have like a great, 
adjustment for that, right? We like we know that we don't know. We have a very strong feeling that Brock Purdy's numbers are more efficient because he's playing in this offense than not. Do I? But I don't have a great way to tease that out. So I mean, we, there are ways we can do that, but you know what I mean. Um, I think so. I guess that's a long way of saying like the value of coaching, uh, which I, I think is being really important. I don't know. There's many ways. The number of ways I think about football differently now versus six years ago is is probably substantial. I think that's probably true for most people that are, you know, like minded and in the data and, and watching every week. But that's that's cool. Let's um, let's talk about past uh, or not, not just past block win rates, but win rates in, uh, in in general that that you guys over there have have kind of developed and, and are popularizing and, and are maybe still a little controversial. I, I think I remember pretty recently sure. uh, a little bit of an arc about how they're made up stat, which is. Um, great, because most stats are <laughs> made up. So tell me a little bit about kind of the inception and the concept behind these win rate metrics. So pass block win rate, win rate or, and pass rush win rate. Yeah, we, when we got access to next gen stats data, that was the first project that Brian Burke wanted to, wanted to undertake. And uh, I think the value was, was obvious to us, right? Like offensive linemen, we know they're important, but we didn't have great ways to quantify them at the time. And so we felt like that was a, or he felt like that was a really great place to start. I think the biggest, the, the story that we told a, a lot internally when we, when we created those metrics was how the importance of the time element. So uh, what I mean by that is we cut this off at two and a half seconds, right? Pass block win rate is the, the rate at which you sustain your block for uh, at least two and a half seconds. And the reason, the story we always told was that when Brian first did this, if you if we didn't have a time element that whatever year he was looking at, I can't remember, um, 2016 or 17, that if we just looked at how often an offensive lineman got beat, period, at any point, Joe Thomas looked like one of the worst tackles in the league. And so Brian was like, well, I'm going to guess uh, that's not right. Uh, and, and I think, you know, quickly realized, of course, well, he's one of the biggest problems is that he's playing in front of Deshaun Kaiser and Kaiser was holding the ball forever. Uh, I think it was Kaiser and it was a few different quarterbacks, but, but that was the one that, that stood out. And that once we, once we decided, well, we need to put everybody on the same playing field, this has to be apples to apples because ultimately every offensive lineman, even for hall of famers clearly uh, get beat eventually. Once we did that and we set, and set the two and a half second mark, you know, he was, I think, ranked third in pass block win rate that year. And, and that to me is just so critical. It's more, you know, I think every day, you know, every day, right. We see this disassociation between offensive linemen and quarterbacks when, especially when it comes to sacks. And we just know that offensive linemen are going to get beat. I think the, you know, one thing sort of like this is an analytics podcast, right? So like, people have asked, well, why, why, you know, why do you just do a binary one zero at the, at the two and a half second mark? And this was a choice because ultimately it, it, the, the metric is actually a survival function. It's actually saying how long until you get beat. Right. And uh, we like Brian pondered, you know, should the, should this be a calculation of the entire curve? That would be ideal. Like from a, if we were, if you were working on a team and you had full buy-in, I think, you know, that would be, that would be correct. But like our trade-off is that we need, need this metric to get bought into. And that's true both externally and internally at ESPN. Uh, we had to get that, that buy-in and it was going to mostly get us there to, to just cut it at two and a half seconds. And I think there are players that I would say now I, I think of as being like a Khalil Mack um, and has never really had great win rates. I think he wins or Daniel Hunter. They win. Uh, I remember specifically looking at this deal, Daniel Hunter once that he, he had an outsized percentage of wins between two and a half and three seconds. So, um, so if we had cut it at three, he probably would look at a, a lot, a lot better, but ultimately I think we, they got us there really close to what it was. And it was, it was a big success for us. I felt like also internally because 
uh, uh, we didn't have, we got to a place where every time there was a free agent signing or a trade involving an offensive lineman, you know, we knew that the article was going to say, you know, where they ranked in pass block win rate. And we just didn't have that context before. Right. In terms of like for our readers, we want to say your team signed this offensive lineman. What's the top line number to know is this person was this, did this person play well last year? And, and so that was, that was a success for us. And it's hard because sacks, for instance, not, not only do they carry a lot of information about the quarterback relative to the offensive lineman, and it's, it's one, it's hard to find, you know, easily accessible and ingestible stats about who got beat to give up the sack and sack allowed. But it's also kind of like touchdown interception ratio where you say, Hey, that's fine. But what happened on the other 300 passing attempts that, you know, you didn't get one of those things. There's a lot of information there. Um, What do you think the best way, uh, to, to, to kind of interpret the, the win rates are? Do you think it goes better in evaluating the offensive linemen or evaluating the rushers? Best, best is normative. I just maybe reframe that and ask, do you think it does better with linemen or with defenders? Uh, great question. I don't, because it's like in, it's just an inversion of the same thing, I would right. say it does the same I think Brian would like for our run win rates, Brian would say it's best the closest to the center. So it feels really good about it when you're talking about like a defensive tackle and it feels pretty good when you're talking about an edge rusher. And uh, if you're talking about like a outside linebacker, like a slot corner, maybe it's not, it doesn't feel as good about it. So, um, but for the pass block and pass rush, which is the primary, it's what I, you know, mostly am focused on usually. I don't, I don't feel like it's, uh, I don't feel like it, the, the one thing I guess you could say would be like just early season or on a single game, the especially early season, like the resolution on guards is going to be so, they win the vast majority of time. And so the difference, the difference is, you know, one play can really swing you. And I think in general, anytime one play can really swing you is when you're saying like, well, this is not a, this is not enough information yet. By the end of the season, you're, you know, or middle of the year, you're fine. But early on, it'll be like, you know, a really good guard has not a great pass block win rate. And it's like, well, he's lost twice. So right. no, <laughs> yeah. it's not scandal. How did pass block win rate and kind of thinking about that lead into your, your kind of, I, I believe it's recent. I don't know if you were doing it last year as well. This, the sack modeling that you've really gotten into. I've been following that on Twitter and, and love seeing you post that. Uh, yeah. Did, did, did the pass block win rates kind of get you into thinking about sacks there? It did. Uh, I did do it last year. Yeah. The um, I've had, it's been a long, a long road of, yeah, the win rates, the win rates like made me pay so much more attention to line play. And at some point I just, I just felt like sacks were just a really interesting metric. It's main, it's mainstream. Everybody knows what they are. Everybody knows the scale. So it's totally bought in. They matter a lot. You get a sack that is like definitively a very good play. And, uh, and, and they're also sort of like, they seem fickle, right? You know, you get, you get like guys will have a a ton of sacks and they won't, and then they will. And, so I did, I did a, a few years ago, I started forecasting. I started, yeah, modeling season level projecting sacks. Um, Can I pull you out of that for a second and ask, yeah. just because this podcast gets a little nerdy and then we'll come back to, to your process yeah, yeah. there. What, what, were there any particular resources or inspiration for you to start, uh, start forecasting? Or as you were thinking, hey, I want to start projecting these season long metrics. How am I going to tackle this? What, what were kind of the tools that you used to, to get into that? um like technical tools um yeah or is there was there a book or something that or oh. a method that you kind of said i like this and 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 uh oh, I see. Okay. With that direction? Yeah. all this time i so since i started espn not the very beginning but pretty soon after i started sort of like uh skilling up technically um started learning you know learning some r then brian mcdonald who was our director at the time actually ran an um r and statistics class for basically like people like me uh and you know other people that were sort of in the in the realm like me or kevin pelton um in, in this realm but we didn't have the the full technical skills um so i had been yeah for lack of a better word skilling up working on more simple models and it was kind of a progression. The first thing I wanted to do was 
um, the first thing I did was create something like like an what I called expected SACs, which I was basically like, this was when I started looking at, when I realized how much SACs were driven by circumstance as opposed to the players involved themselves. So, or, or, so from the pass rushers perspective, it's driven by who the quarterback is certainly, but, and, and who you are facing though. I didn't include that who, which tackle tackle or guard or center you're facing that matters, but I didn't include that, but uh, like down in distance, what's the score? Um, uh, are you blitzing? How many people are blitzing? How many people are blocking? Ultimately, like sacks come a lot of times out of desperation. So if you're up, if you, the defense are up by 10 and it is third and 10 and they're on their own 30 and it's right. The, the quarterback is, has to get a big play. So that's where you're most likely to get those sacks. And I realized that Players had oh where you're where you're rushing from right are you coming from the edge are you rushing as an off ball linebacker are you, a, are you a defensive tackle getting double teamed so all these things meant that like guys had different sack expectations so expectation meaning if I remove any knowledge of who you are just the circumstances of your pass rush uh, what would be the tr- probability that you would record a sack on that play so on a play level basis I did that and I did I did that project and. This was the year when uh, Leonard Floyd, I guess, was – I remember the, the, the big takeaway was like Leonard Floyd, I think that was his first 10-sack season. He'd had a 10-sack season or whatever. Um, but I looked at it, you know, and I was like, well, he – his expectation was like 9.6, which was like the highest. And it was so – he was on a pretty good team, but he was also playing next to Aaron Donald. That was that was a big thing. Who your teammates were was a really really drove it, and so it was like, you know, that's fine, that's good. You met expectation, but like other players who got ten sacks only had an expectation of six, and so there can be like when we talk about how much how impactful these guys are, there was a there was a disparity there. Um, ultimately, I rolled that expectation number or sacks over expectation into when I later, when I later projected sacks for the next season, I will say I did this past year when I was rerunning my projected sacks It is not that predictive. The sacks over expectation. Once I have all the other information and this year was going to be honestly a huge pain to run, rerun the expected sacks. I mean, this is like code is like four years old at this point. So like for me, that's like, it's like, it's like, it's like there's cobwebs all over it. And I was like, you know, that's, what? Pre, that's prehistoric at this point. Yeah. percent is good. If I just cut this out. <laughs> that's That's important. That's important to know when, when to, you know, when to, when to focus on, uh, on, on, um, yeah, what, what, what to focus on and what, what the attention matters and what the output you're getting is there. Um, interesting. And, and, and so now you're doing, oh, yeah. uh, and, and last year you're doing a model where you're looking at opposing quarterback. You're looking at some of those on a kind of a game to game level. Um, yeah, so but I, what are some, I don't give any state secrets away, but kind of what are some of the things that go into that game to game uh, projection? If I were, you know, a millionaire off of this, I would, I would guard these secrets, but, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, so what I'm looking at is, your past, so, so sort of thing is like, you know, your past production as a, as a pass rusher, your opponent, opponent information. So that's both the quarterback and the offensive line as a whole. Uh, but I don't, I don't do any individual, like, yeah, ideally I'd be like, wow, you know, this guy, you're going against the backup right tackle that should really increase your, yeah, I don't have that would, it would just be more difficult. But um, so I'm looking at, you, the pass rusher, who you're playing from an offensive line tackle standpoint, honestly. Uh, so quarterback drives it a ton, right? If you were playing Justin Fields, you were playing Sam Howell, you are way more likely to get a sack because uh, those guys take sacks at, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe three times the clip of a uh, Trevor Lawrence or maybe six times the clip of a Patrick Mahomes. So uh, six is a bit much. Four and a half times on the Patrick Mahomes. Low frequency know. events. It maybe it feel it feels like a six, even if it yeah. might not mathematically be exactly that. Um, 
So there's that, that factor, uh, how often you're playing. And then I think somewhat crucially, how often you're playing in clear pass rushing situations. So, uh, I, that's important because you want to sort of separate out. There can be guys who play quite a bit, but they're better run defenders. They might be coming off the field on third and 10 as that's not the guy you want. Um, on the other hand, you can have guys who are good run defenders and that just means that they play a lot. So some of those first and tens will result in sacks. And if you, if you have enough, if you're just, if you're just on the field all the time, that really does, that really does matter, but you got to be on the field for those key pass rushing situations um, where you're lining up certainly matters. If you're a defensive tackle, your, your probability of recording a sack plummets, no matter who you are, just because of the nature of you getting double teams. So um, those are a lot of, a lot of the factors, the spread, if, if I didn't mention that is what, you know, I used to essentially, uh, you know, you're trying to predict game flow pretty much. Yeah, and, and potential game states and whether you're going to get in that long, desperate, desperate situation. Um, exactly. And, yeah. you, and not only that, but if you're a big favorite, then you're probably going to get out to lead. Your opponent now has to pass more. So now there's just more opportunities for sex. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's that, that's fun. That kind of problem is fun just because it is. It's, there's a lot of zeros. Um, there's not a lot of variation. Yeah. You know, two sacks in a game is amazing. And so it's it's really kind of are they going to get one at all? And that's a, that's a fun kind of uh, modeling, modeling problem there. And, and people can follow along on your Twitter. You've been posting those for, for some games and it had been, been kind of fun there to see. And I also post um, them on my, my Sunday betting column is a lot of sacks. Oh, perfect. So, okay. So the Sunday betting column that I do is like mostly niche props. The idea of it was like, if you're betting on Sunday, you probably shouldn't bet like Vikings plus three at that point. Like, uh, and so like, maybe you should bet some obscure things. And so I do, uh, like sacks and a lot of defense sacks and tackles. I am, I am, I'm closing in on uh, defensive interceptions, uh, which is, which should be fun. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, honestly, I've been betting those sacks now for a year and a half and I find it like really enjoyable to look at this, like one obscure market and, uh, you know, be like, what, Grady Jarrett plus 420 to get a sack. That's a great number. You know, it's, uh, we didn't that's get that's, 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 fun, that's that a fun line. kind of nuts and bolts stuff. Yeah, that's 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 really fun. Um, okay, I think I have three more things that I want to talk to you about looking at our time here. One of those is I do want to let you plug everything. I'm going to do that at the end so people can know where to find the find find everything because you you do put out a lot of content over there. Um, the one thing I want to acknowledge and not talk about very long is your fourth down decision. Um, the, 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 the decision graphics one look great this season. Love oh. that you guys are tweeting them out. Thank you. I'm, just no, it's not me, but thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm exhausted by the fourth down discourse. I, I fell into it during the Oregon Washington game and immediately regretted it. Um, and I think it's almost like as, as analysts, we have to do as little as possible to, to engage it and just say like, Nope, there's a pretty clear cut formula here. And, and this goes, uh, so I, I want to acknowledge that you do some great, great work contextualizing and, and talking about those. And I'm kind of over the <laughs> I'm over the uh, the fourth down discourse entirely. Um, I do see you from time to time again, talk about uh, the, the motion report, about who's using the most motion uh, pre-snap. And and I had a couple questions. Um, one, what do you think that tells us about a team? <clears throat> to me, it, well, in some ways it's like, stylistic i think it's it's somewhat of an indication of like uh, what i'm tempted to say i don't know tell me if you disagree with this i'm tempted to say it's like in somewhat of an indication of like how modern your offense is um, and i think about that because like the motion has just wildly increased over the last five five six years um and so are you keeping up with that trend? I'm not, I'm not like, well, I will put, I do think it is a positive, but, um, but I think, yeah, maybe it's, I mean, like another way to put it would be like how McVeigh Shanahan are you, but that's not entirely true either. Like they just, they use a lot of it. It doesn't mean that your offense has to be like it, that if you use a lot of it, but obviously there's different kind of like, when we started looking at motion, right, I think the the purpose was somewhat different than like what we're seeing with Miami. Like 
2023. Before, the general idea was uh, put your opponent in conflict. Uh, you're not giving them any chance to react. So you might be, they have their run fits, and now maybe you've got your man running in between Right. He's he's in motion. So do both do all defenders read that person as being in the same place? And the answer is maybe yes, but maybe no. Uh, or, you know, the same the same basic thing can be true in in coverage. And um, I remember I'm grateful to when I first wrote about it in 2019 and, and Lewis Riddick went on TV and was talking about motion. And he was talking about how he remembered being as a player having that motion happen, putting you, just causing that disruption, putting you in conflict. And so I think all of those reasons are why it worked. It was, you know, in, 20, in 2019, it was showing a clear advantage for uh, when teams did it. And now, of course, we have Miami, which I'm sure that's all true for the Dolphins, but they're also using it as basically like fast guys get a head start. And that, <laughs> that seems good too. Uh, so uh, I've been really interested in this. It was a, you know, I give a lot of credit to our, I wrote about this in 2019 when the Ravens were, the Ravens were doing this. We, we, we had found that our video tracking team had started tracking motion. They had the foresight to separate it out into motion and set and motion at the snap, which ended up being critical because we ended up seeing no advantage whatsoever for a man who goes in motion and then comes set, uh, which I think makes sense, right? Given all the all the things, um, so they had that that foresight, and then we saw that this was having an effect no matter which way you looked at it. League wide numbers, you compared team to te team, you know, team with motion to not motion. However, you did it, it, it we should, we showed an effect run pass. Um, and I'll never forget because what happened was we, I was I basically done the research, hadn't written the story. It was Monday Night Football. There was this amazing Ravens Rams game, and the Ravens just blew out the Rams. And I'm watching this game, and Sean McVay in his post game presser says they did an amazing job with motion. They ruined all our fits, caused confusion. And I was like, oh man, I got to write this story right now. And so I just like stayed up until three in the morning and and wrote it. Uh, and we ran it that week. That's that's really fun. Yeah, I, I, I think the motion conversation is almost like chicken and the egg because it, especially in the NFL, is it like, do you do a lot of motion to try and create matchups or do you do a lot of motion because you have a lot of athletes and you can just you could just school yeah. people by putting them in the right position in college? I've looked a little bit about frequency and disparity between non-motion and motion plays. It's like how mm -hmm. often you're in motion and that, that stuff that I think in college, we get a little more stylistic heterogeneity, get a little more talent dispersion. And you can see those big drop-offs and think, okay, here's a coach leveraging. Perfect example, Coastal Carolina up until this year with, uh, you know, is doing a ton of motion, has, you know, I think a 22 percentage point advantage on plays with motion as opposed to without motion and is running it a ton. That coach leaves and you think, okay, Coastal Carolina is going to regress a little bit. It's a little bit more about the coaching there. So in the NFL, it's really interesting to kind of think about, you know, how the athleticism really determines what you can and can't do at that, the wide receiver um position there as well but that's that's another one i like those style metrics where it's kind of like uh hey at the top you know it's generally better but it's not necessarily a straight line from this is good and this is bad you've got to think about it a little bit that's right and we've seen as it's as it's increased right and it's dramatic so in 2017 the rams ran motion nine percent of the motion at the snap nine percent of the time that would be like half of the average value now for, for a team. And the Dolphins are doing it 62% of the time uh, this year. And they have a huge split on what you're talking about. Like they're, they, their offense has a negative EPA on, on non-motion at the snap plays, I think. Uh, the effect has been mitigated. I mean, until like if you'd asked me before this year when it's it's like going back up again, um, the, effect, the effect had been mitigated almost entirely on, on run plays going into, I think this season, I want to say that's right. Don't, don't quote me on that. I'm saying on the, <laughs> but like clearly the effect had been mitigated. And so uh, I think it was a good sign maybe for your offense, if you were using motion, but I, it's not like, um, it's not like play action in that in that way. Right. So, um, but then again, like, but now we're looking at it and, and again, I'm again, this year we are seeing, e even if you remove Miami teams are doing better 
running run plays with motion than than without them. Interesting. Right. A lot of lot of lot of layers there, and and uh, yeah, because again, you've got to watch some film to know too. Uh, to you know, what does the motion look like and all that as well. So that's 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 a that's a fun one to kind of quantify. Uh, Seth Walder, sports analytics writer at ESPN. Where can people uh, follow you and uh, and read your work? Uh, on Twitter, uh, at Seth Walder, that's the easiest place. And then my work is on ESPN.com. Uh, I'll, I write those stories. Check out that betting column on Sundays and the statistical nuggets on Saturdays. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, that watch the film comment. Um, and uh, you guys actually, you watch the games, Parker? Never. Not yeah, never. okay. Good. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And, cool. Uh, well, yeah. well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So ESPN and, and your Twitter and all there, and we'll link some of that in the show notes. Thanks for this conversation. Really enjoyed it, man. Really like your work and, and enjoy. Uh, you're, you're a very good Twitter follow and uh, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great talk over there. Take care.